We're inside the gift shop at Tom Sturgis Pretzels, and I'm here with Bruce Sturgis, the president of the company. Bruce, we were having a conversation a couple of minutes ago about some of the historical tins that you have around the wall, but this whole business has a history, and it began with Julius back in 1861. Can you reach back in time, Civil War era, and bring us forward to the family history of pretzels? Julius was my great-great-grandfather. Um, he learned the trade from another baker. This was in the town of Lidditz, um, and then started his own pretzel bakery, making hard pretzels, and initially they made soft pretzels. Uh, he had 14 children. A number of those children also went into the pretzel business. Um, Nathan, uh, William, and Lewis were specific children of Julius. Marriott, who was also known as Tom Sturgis, my grandfather moved to Reading in probably the late 20s, early 30s, and started a bakery here in Reading with his brother Carell. Um, they were in business together until World War II. Uh, their, all their help was drafted into the service, their uh, bakers specifically. Um, after World War II, uh, my grandfather Marriott started up uh, on his own again, and that would, would have been 1946, and that's when Tom Sturgis Pretzels uh, started. And he was in uh, city proper of Reading. Uh, since then, my grandfather and father had about five or six different bakeries in the Reading, Berks County area. Um, and we've been here on Route 222 since 1970. Uh, my father, Tom, is still active in the business. Comes in four to five days a week to keep his eye on things. Uh, he's also our master gardener right now. He got that <laughs> through seniority. That's his preference. Well, I have to note the flowers out front are outstanding. Of course, you see the great big pretzel out there. Oftentimes when my children and I are driving by, especially when they were very young, they wanted to stop and stand next to the pretzel. They asked me about the salt, uh, which is symbolized on the pretzel, was actually real or not. But, you know, you, you have to love this business to stay in it as long as your family has. Your dad is out here still working, your mother comes in and they're in their 80s. Uh, there's a passion for this. Tell us a little bit about your love for pretzels, this business, marketing, the store. It's, it's something, we're, we're a small business. Um, it's something that we get to wear a lot of hats. Uh, we're fortunate that we are able to meet a lot of people because of that. Uh, and I think our family in general has been very fortunate through the years, and my grandfather told me this as well as my father, we've been fortunate to work with a lot of good people. Um, it's, some days it's hard to come to work, it is for everyone, but there's always a new challenge and uh, we thrive on it, I guess. There are some days even for state legislators <laughs> when you're facing tough issues with the state. but. Your family has been involved in this for generations. Why here? Why Berks County? How did that all come into being? I know it started down in Lidditz, but you've got a footprint in this county. And I guess a general question, there's other pretzel factories in this area. And if you look at a map of Pennsylvania and you're considering a tourist visit, you see a pretzel in some maps over the Reading metropolitan area. Why is it that pretzels specifically are so anchored in this area? We've, we've generally, in this area, uh, Berks County uh, and Lancaster County, we've had uh, very good agricultural land. Soft red winter wheat flour grows here, and that's, that's our main ingredient. Uh, we have good water supplies in this area. Uh, we basically have a good work ethic from the people in this area. Uh, and I could name probably three bakeries other than ourselves right now. We have uh, very good competition. People like good food in the area and that pertains to snacks too. Tell us a little bit about soft pretzel, hard pretzel, types of pretzels. There's a variety of products that you produce. Uh, we, we bake the hard pretzel. That's um, a soft pretzel taken a step further. Uh, a soft pretzel probably 
ends up with about maybe 9% moisture, 7 to 9% moisture in the final product. Um, I love to eat them, but you have to eat them fresh. The hard pretzel can be, um, it's a lower moisture percentage, maybe one, one and a half percent moisture with a finished product. You can package them and you can deliver them to your customers, they'll keep. Shelf life maybe five months for a hard pretzel uh, and still be considered fresh. In, in terms of business cycles, I mean, you would think that people are eating pretzels all the time regardless of the economy. How do ups and downs, recessions and so on in the economy affect your business? In the past, generally, uh, a recession meant a boom for pretzel people. People were staying home. They weren't making the big purchases, but they still needed something to feel good about. Um, that, that basically changed in the last five, six, seven years. Um, when things got slower in our country, it affected everyone, not, not just uh, the auto manufacturers and the home builders. Um, right now, our better times, summer because of picnics and, and snacking, uh, but also the holidays. I would say most of the pretzel people would say from October through December, that's, that's their real busy time. You mentioned pretzels in a context I'm not accustomed to hearing about, almost as a comfort food. Yes. People enjoy them so much. Today, there are so many more different varieties of pretzels than there were historically. Do you have a number on that? I mean, we walked around the store here and there was a little free sample section and I saw more opportunities to eat pretzels than I ever imagined. How many different varieties are there? Oh my goodness. I have to think about oh, that. Oh well, okay. I didn't mean to ask oh, you the impossible question. Dozens. 25, 30 perhaps. Okay. We, ourselves, we probably do about 20 different pretzels. Um, the flavors that we're using, we're baking those flavors in. Uh, and then you also have the option to have coatings and flavors put on the outside. Um, we do subcontract to some companies to do that for us. Um, Contemporary eating habits, how are we keeping up? I mean, gluten-free, and then I notice you've got some products here that are sugar-free. How has the company and its product line evolved with consumer demand? Basically, what our company is doing is selling products uh, with natural ingredients. Uh, we do not have gluten-free at this point in time. Um, there are companies that do that, and basically I applaud them for being able mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, with our bakery, it's a small bakery, we cannot dedicate a line to that. I understand. Uh, but basically, we're using the natural, local ingredients as much as possible. Um, and pretzels inherently are not high in fat. Uh, the sodium, well, that depends on what kind of pretzels you like. Uh, Judging by your appearance, pretzels have done you well through the years. <laughs> there may be a hard work ethic there as well, or exercising, but you look like you're in tremendous condition. It's also very warm in a pretzel bakery. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, you've got an attractive facade out here. It's highly visible. We're on a tourist route. How many drive-bys do you get and say, wow, I didn't realize you were here, or even a local had never visited your store before and they come in? That happens frequently, that uh, our, our plant looks like a manufacturing plant. We try to keep it nice, but uh, there's a lot of people that come through here that, uh, boy, I didn't know you were here. I didn't know you had so many products available. That's uh, something that uh, we can show all our products here where we can't in necessarily in the supermarket. There was a long time where this road right here was heavily congested. They bypassed around it. How did it affect your business model, if at all, a number of years ago when that 222 was consummated? That 222 bypass was very much needed for the county in general, but it was very hard on the businesses on this stretch of Route 222. We probably lost a third of our retail business, mm. the walk-in customers because the people that were traveling to other business, salespeople, whatever, 
They'd always used to come right down through Shillington. They don't anymore. Now some people have told us they will still take the exit and come here, but uh, we're trying to adapt to that now. All right, well let's go and we're gonna sample some products over here and you can show me what your favorites are over in the free sample section right. in this area. Right. Well, there's a variety of products over here, Bruce. Uh, let me just ask you a personal question. Do you have a favorite as we look at all these different free samples here I that do. are available? Yes, okay, I, and where I would do. that be? This one right here. Right there. This here. Okay, and that's called the Crunch Cells? Crunch Cells, yes. And why is that a favorite of all these other opportunities? What makes this one stand out? Uh, just what the name says it itself, it's a little bit harder biting. It's a, it's a gnarly, crunchy type pretzel. Uh, it's overproofed pretzel. Uh, and that proofing helps develop the flavor. I see. Um, now, you've got other hard pretzels here and lots of different opportunities for people, including chocolate sticks. Now, I know if my staff were here, they would be eating the chocolate sticks. Okay, so I'm guessing that cinnamon sugar, chocolate sticks, honey graham are popular as well. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Probably. Uh the cinnamon sugar, then the honey graham, then the chocolate in that order. All of those are uh, a sweeter type pretzel. Uh, we've been making those just in the last two or three years. D directly behind you over here, we have hands-on pretzel twisting lessons. Uh, these take place on Wednesdays. What would I expect if I walked in here on Wednesday, and do I have to make an appointment to participate in this program? No appointments needed. Uh, if you come in here and bring your parents and your children, uh, everyone's welcome to do it. We're just trying to give anyone who has an interest uh, an idea of what it was for the generations before us to bake the pretzels. Uh, you'll get raw dough that we've uh, made here, prepared here, and uh, we'll teach you how to roll it out on the authentic rolling boards. Uh, of the 17, 1800s, and basically we'll teach you the steps of twisting the pretzel. Well, we certainly look forward to that opportunity. I have five daughters ranging in age from one to 14. I'm just afraid that they would be eating all of the material before they got to the point of pretzel. So I may bring one or two of them in, but let's take a, a walk in the factory and look around and see where all these fine products are made. Sounds good. Here we are in the plant floor. We've got flour in the back room. We got mixing facility here. Bruce, walk us through where we're at, what's going on, where are the materials coming from, and how they end up here. All right, our flour is uh, delivered in bulk trucks. We have three bins. There's a 110,000 pound capacity in each bin. Uh, the reason we have those bins is we're able to blend our flours. Uh, to get a more stable pretzel, more consistent pretzel over time. Uh, the flour is delivered to the uh, scale above the mixer pneumatically um, so that we don't have to handle 150 pound bags like we did 50 years ago. Uh, once the flour is in the mixer, then we add the other incidental ingredients, the yeast, the malt, uh, the shortening, some salt perhaps, and uh, in this case today we're making uh, cheddar cheese pretzels, so there's ground up cheddar cheese in the mixer also. And we're going to see some of that material come out now, if I'm not mistaken. We have a mixed dough in the mixer, and uh, Trevor's going to jog the mixer. That's, uh, I believe, about a 240 pound mix coming out, 240 of flour, uh, also includes the other ingredients. Um. And as I look at this piece of equipment as an addendum, there's tremendous cleaning responsibilities here that go with this, maintenance as well. Every, every uh, at, at the end of a pretzel run, we have to scrape down and basically pressure wash the equipment. Um, Trevor's putting the dough in the extruder hopper right now. Uh, you see he's doing it by hand. This is an old baking line. 
Uh, we're still using it. It is labor intensive, but the product quality that comes out of the stone hearth oven is exceptional. I know you've got some newer pieces of equipment that we're going to see here in a little bit. How old is this particular machine that you're using right now? This particular machine is 40 years this year. It was uh, 1974 when we started this baking line. Now we have upgraded it. You can see there's stainless steel uh, involved, but uh, in essence, it's the same baking line. So a well-maintained piece of equipment like this can last literally for decades. As long as we do our part, we could be making pretzels probably another 20, 25 years here. All right and this particular line is headed into the oven area. Yes. So as we follow this production line along, what's happening as it's exposed to the air here? Is it drying out, losing some moisture before it gets to the oven, setting? What all happens during this pathway? At what's happening here really is what you said and also flavor development. The time here that it's taking to go into the next step, the cooker, uh, this is all flavor develop, development. There's some sourdough in this dough, and it's allowing gases to develop, uh, to develop for the flavor. So as we're headed into this area, I can begin to feel the heat already. Yes. So we're stepping into an area of ovens. Yes, yes, and we're also heating the area around the ovens right now. What would the temperature differential be between this room and where we're standing right now? This is probably about 30 degrees warmer in the 30 oven degrees room. warmer. Yeah. Yep. Bruce, we're moving on the conveyor belt into another section of the plant. Uh, traditionally, the baking and drying and the salting and the bathing go on. Can you walk us through each step of the process that I've just described here in brief? At the end of the proofing, they're going into what's called a cooker. It's basically a large bath of boiling water that has a sodium hydroxide solution in, in and that. And that, that would be right in this area here where yes. that bath is taking place. Yes, yes. Uh, the pretzels are immersed in the boiling solution. Uh, that that solution gives the pretzels a brownish coating on the outside, also a little bit of flavor. And this is the part that I like because I'm a salt lover. And they're being salted right in this area. Yeah, the, the pretzels that just came out of the bath are tacky on the surface and salt is dropped from the top on, on them and uh, usually it adheres pretty well at this point. Suddenly this room has gotten a whole lot warmer for me and it's got something to do with these ovens over here. All right. We're using uh, probably on this oven, there's probably about 200 uh, individual open flame ribbon burners above the hearth, uh, below the hearth, uh, and that flame and the hearth stones radiate the heat that bakes the pretzels. Pennsylvania has become a leader in natural gas production. It looks like there's a whole lot of gas going into this. There's a lot of BTUs going into a pretzel oven. Is there a chance we can take a gander and look into that oven? Tell us what the sure. temperature is inside of there. Sure. Um, in this oven, we're baking generally at 550 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can see the, the flames there. Uh, gas is a real good fuel, uh, and we're fortunate in that we have it here in Pennsylvania now. Very fortunate indeed. As we continue uh, through the area of the ovens, which is extensive in length, the pretzels are dropping out and they're moving into a drying area, as I recall. Right. They're coming out of the uh, out of the oven as a baked soft pretzel, basically, and the dryer will make them into a, a dried, ready-to-eat hard pretzel. All right, and these will be packaged, we'll see a little further in boxes. Yes. All right. What is the approximate length of this room? We've got a long baking area, we've got a long drying area, many things happening in between. How much length and square footage do we have in the baking area? Oh, uh, we have about uh, probably 250 feet long. Uh, as far as the square footage, that's probably about uh, 
30,000 square feet of banking area. How many employees in this particular region of the plant? In this area, yeah. we're, we only have, uh, we're baking two lines right now, we have two employees. Okay, so you're very efficient in your use of resources and employees. We're done, pretzels are come rolling off here. Can you take us for a little bit of a tour as we wrap up into the packaging area of the plant? Sure. All right. Bruce, we had talked over in the uh, section that we first entered the factory in about vintage equipment. This equipment over here is newer. Tell us what is going on in your manufacturing with the newer equipment and how new. The newer equipment is basically much larger scale than the old the vintage equipment. Everything has been designed proportionately larger so that the different steps, the proofing, the cooking, the baking, and the drying all give the same amount of time as the old lines, proportionate. What we can do on this newer line, we probably can do five times the production, the poundage of finished pretzels with the same baker that we can on the older line. Now, even if we were using older style equipment, each, each piece of equipment has its own personality. Uh, so we're, we're trying to replicate what we did with the older equipment, but just do it in a more efficient manner. Uh, this equipment is newer. You've got the vintage, in terms of the mechanics and the know-how and keeping both of them running. Can the same team of people keep this newer equipment running as the old? This piece of equipment here is uh, probably the younger, the tech-savvy person okay. can operate this one better than the vintage equipment. The older baker or employee could probably deal with the older equipment better. It's just, there's generations of technology here. There's distinctives and skill sets in order to keep things running here. Now, this looks to me like a huge capital investment, all right? I don't know if you know the overall cost of this production line, but it looks, you do, it looks substantive. Tell us about that. This, this baking line, uh, which is now about 10 years old, probably was about a three and a half million dollar investment. We're still tweaking it, and when I say tweaking it, fifty, hundred thousand dollar changes to try to get the quality that we'd like. Our, our strategy for selling is not low pricing, it's good quality. You're here to stay. You've made a huge investment in this community. Where do you purchase a piece of equipment like this? Uh, fortunately, locally. There's a comp company called Reading Bakery Systems in uh, Wommelsdorf, Pennsylvania, a few miles from here and that's who we purchased it uh, from and they worked they gave their input their ideas and they incorporated some of ours also i like every part of this story you're going to take us into the packaging and eventually the shipping area of the factory now let's take a walk in that direction we're in the packaging area this is an enormous parcel right here how many pounds does it weigh and how long does it take to fill this thing up and where is it going uh, that that probably holds six, 600 to 650 pounds of, of finished product. Uh, I can't divulge where it's going. <laughs> That's fine. How long does it take to fill this box up? Uh, that probably will take 40, 45 minutes to fill that box up. All right, and you've got folks walking the floor here monitoring. And then as I was walking by this area over here, it struck me as interesting that some of this is headed for animal consumption. It didn't meet your high standards and it's being shipped out to area farms. Yeah, it's, it's not basically what I like to see when I come in in the morning, but uh, our bakers and our four people uh, have to decide whether this product is up to our standards and uh, if it's not, we're not gonna put it in the package. So you're looking at color, salt, moisture content, there's a variety mm -hmm. of ingredients. Yep. And something that I more traditionally see, your box 
package over here, your pretzel gems. They're coming right off the production line and they're being packaged in this area. Yeah, these are a uh, uh, bulk product. We have local customers that buy these in this particular package. These go to farmer's markets. Uh, and uh, we also sell quite a bit of these to uh, some of the Mennonite and Amish communities. Off in the background, we've got packaging equipment, a lot of technology. Once again, a significant investment in this room. It's, it's considerable, but uh, over time, it, it hopefully is worth it. And to keep it all running, you've got technical people and yeah. they've got expertise. From what I understand, you're trying to cross-pollinate that technical ability so they can work on a variety of pieces of equipment. We have three really good uh, technical maintenance people. Uh, but also our four people and our bakers and my father and myself, we help with the maintenance also. Uh, you have to when you're in a small business, you have to wear a lot of hats. It looks like a very hands-on company through the generations beginning in 1861 with your great, great grandfather, Julius. Well, they tell me there's some snacks out in the lobby there, so uh, why don't we wrap up by visiting your store out there again? I like that idea. Bruce, your gift store is not just about traditional pretzels, but you've even got a sugar-free line of pretzels here, which attracted my eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're uh, extra special. Uh, my children certainly enjoy them. In fact, one of my daughters is at camp, and just as a little daddy note to her, I attached a bag of uh, sugar-free pretzels, and she especially enjoys those. You know, we think about some of the traditional products, but you could come in here and you could buy yourself a box or a parcel or a gift wrap. Something's all ready to go for the birthday party, Christmas, Easter, whatever the holiday happens to be. Our store people, they're constantly coming up with new ideas here. They amaze me. And things change seasonally. So if I were here during the summer uh, versus December as we're in the midst of the holiday season, I'd see different products on the shelf. Oh yeah, yep, yep. We're changing, trying to uh, think ahead uh, and be ready when the people come in the door. Um, these little insulated bags here, it looks like something you can go to a ball game, a picnic, uh, or out on the summer day as well. It's the Tom Sturgis lunch bag. And it's actually the first time I've seen them on the shelf. That's how good <laughs> our people are. <laughs> you don't have to go to the farmer's market. We've got apple butter spread with sugar and spice, and I'm going to have to admit this pumpkin a butter caught my eye. It's a favorite of mine, and so it's all available here at the store. You, um, you've certainly been very gracious with us. We've enjoyed our visit, and after my children see this on TV, I guarantee that seven members of the Gillen family will be back to say hello to you and enjoy some of your products. Thank you so much. We appreciate the generosity of your time and the wonderful family tradition of Sturgis pretzels. Thank you. I'm State Representative Mark Gillen, and that's all the time that we have for today's legislative report. If you have any questions at all about state-related business, please call our office at 610-775-5130.